how lovely it is to be in God's house. And I really mean it. I know some people come to church under great sufferance, but I just love being in his house. I look forward to Sundays, look forward to being with my brothers and sisters. But there's just something about coming home. A lot of people, when they walk into church, that's what they say. They say, oh, I feel like I've come home. Because they have. Welcome to all you people that are watching online. I'm expecting that there's a few more of you this week because this church is starting to take um, a good shape and it's going to be challenging to some. We're all here, people, for such a time as this. We all need to be prepared for what's ahead. We're going to be challenged. We're going to be knocked off our perches. And we need to stand firm in Jesus. Now, if you're watching online and you're not a Christian, there's a scripture in Corinthians that says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. So if you're watching online, and I'm not sure why you're watching online, some will be because of the COVID stuff, some will be because you're overseas, some will be because you're being challenged, and some will be because you want to challenge. I just want to say to you that this might seem as foolishness to you if you don't know Jesus. But if you'll just bend your knee to him, if you'll just acknowledge that there could be someone greater than you who created you, then you're in for a life-changing experience. Now, I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, that I'm looking at the camera because I'm speaking to those people who don't know Jesus yet. Yet, the word says that God orders our steps. Perhaps he's ordered your steps to be watching online. And I just pray that God is really going to change you today just by his power. I was up through the night praying. I was praying in tongues and I've been doing that for quite a while now. As you know, as my brothers and sisters know, I've been getting up most nights and I've been praying in tongues and I lie in bed and I wake up and I think, oh, it's getting cold. Can I just pray for my prodigal here in bed? And somehow I feel like I'm missing an appointment in my prayer chair, which is just simply the couch in the lounge room. And I get that foot out of the bed, put my dressing gown on and I go out there. I think Rob's just used to me getting out of bed in the middle of the night. And I've been praying for our son. I pray in the spirit. And it was hard work to start with. Praying in tongues is really hard. It's like, well, I know I'm looking around the room. Some of you would be saying, oh, no, it's easy, Debbie. It is something that you grow in. If you don't pray in tongues, you need to be praying in tongues. It's a gift. It's a weapon. I don't want you to sit there thinking, oh, I've heard all this before and unless I'm praying in tongues, then I'm not really saved or I'm not really a Christian. It's a lot of rubbish. It's a great weapon that you can have because praying for my prodigal, God's prodigal, my prodigal, I've run out of words to pray. I don't know any more. And I can assure you, we are seeing a miraculous thing happen in our son. Yeah. I spoke about how this is foolishness to you if you don't know Jesus, the message of the cross. But to us here who know Jesus, it's the power of God to hear about the cross. Now, last night when I was praying for my prodigal, because I'm getting more fluent and it's easier to pray in the spirit, 
I'm finding that I'm starting to branch out now into other areas. And one of the things that came in the prayer last night was that God's going to do something very special here today. He's ordered your steps to be here. Today's all about the Holy Spirit. He's always here, but sometimes he just does something very special. I think we were going to have a picture of a dove up there. Maybe it's not happening today. He's not a picture. He's a real person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. I just want to pray. Father, I am so thankful for everybody here that you're going to touch in a very special way today. And I'm very thankful those who are watching online. Father, I pray you're going to touch them in a very special way too. That they're going to meet their maker in the best possible way. And I pray for you people online that don't know Jesus, just open up your heart. Just be willing. Don't be hard-hearted with a heart of stone. Just be willing to take a risk. Amen. I want to talk to you about different Christians, those of us in Christ, who think that the Holy Spirit comes at different times. Like, some of us, people that would generally go to um, uniting churches, Baptist churches, Methodists, Church of Christ, those churches are called evangelical churches. That doesn't mean that they're evangelistic, and they are, but being evangelical is a bit different from being evangelistic. We're all called to go in Jesus' name. But evangelical Christians believe that when you come to Christ, when you bend your knee, when you repent of your sins, just going to talk to the people online again, sorry. When you repent of your sins, when you are able to say, oh, maybe I'm not God. Or maybe you're saying, oh, look, I don't have sins. I'm not a sinner. I remember I said that. I was really, I went to a christening and this minister at a uniting church got so up my nose talking about my sins. All I wanted to hear about was love, actually. But now I realise that, well, heaven is going to be a place where there is no sin. But if I'm, I'm the one who determines who goes into heaven, where is the cutoff? If somebody I love is murdered... Well then, yeah, there's no place for them in heaven who, who did the murdering. Or maybe if someone stole my car and they drove it around for 20 years and I couldn't prove it was my car, is there a place for them in heaven? Well, no, because that was my car. Or what if it's somebody who just pushed me over and I didn't get that job that I was after and someone else got it because they pushed me over? Is there a place for them in heaven? No, definitely not. So when we do need to repent because there can be no sin in heaven, but if you don't bend your knee, how is it you're going to determine who can get in and who can't? The world doesn't even think that hell exists anymore. Do you believe there's a heaven? Yes, we believe there is a heaven. Do you believe there is a hell? Oh, no, no, God is too good for that. God would not send anybody to hell. So now we have this new doctrine, new group called universalists who believe that everybody's going to go to heaven. Well, I'm not sure. So evangelicals believe when we repent... When we come to Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's another group, Pentecostals. They believe when we come to Christ and we bend the knee, we say, 
Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. They believe that that's all that is, really. And there is a second thing that happens to us called a second, I don't know what it's called, a second coming of, of second blessing. And what they believe is we repent, but then we wait for that second blessing to come. Now, I'm of the first belief because when I came to Christ, I was changed. It was slow and subtle, but I was changed. It wasn't quick and rapid, but like a snowball, it did get quicker and quicker and quicker. Within three months of me being saved, I was teaching RI in a school and I was teaching it to the little year ones, they were grade ones then, and I was so excited talking about the life of Moses to these little kids and I would say how Pharaoh wanted all the babies killed and so uh, Jochebed put a baby in a basket, a papyrus basket, a basket and put little Moses in there and he went down the river and Miriam, his sister, watched and Pharaoh's daughter was bathing. And when I was telling these little kids about this story, I was so excited. I was so full of God's spirit in the, in the whole story of it. And I remember the teacher said, uh, Debbie, she said, which church is it that you go to again? And I said, oh, I go to the Baptist church, actually, in the town. Now, although it was the Baptist church, it was the church that had life and love in it. There was only about, I don't know, maybe when I think about it, I thought it was a big church. There were probably 30 or 40 people in it. And you know what? For months I didn't hear a word of those sermons, but I felt the love of the people. I felt the move of the Spirit. And that's what kept me going back all the time. Now... There's another group of people that think you receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. So, until you are baptised in water, some will think sprinkling's enough, some will think full immersion is better. Jesus was fully immersed in water in the Jordan River by his cousin, John the Baptist. So, I would think what Jesus does is a really good leading for us to do. You know, in the Bible, it doesn't say anything about denominations. So one denomination does it this way, another denomination does it that way. You know birds of a feather flock together. So one denomination does this. Maybe that's okay. But Jesus did this, boom, right into the water. So Rob and I, we were baptised in a river up in outback Queensland. Speedboats going around us. I'm glad we weren't chopped up with a speedboat. Our pastor, who was about three years older than us, so he must have been about 29 or something or younger, he was so excited that we were doing this publicly. So, some people believe you receive the Holy Spirit when you go into the waters and you come back up. There's another group of people that think, well, yes, you receive the Holy Spirit whenever that is, but we leak, and we leak big time. And I have leaked over the years, I have leaked terribly. Of the lack of the Holy Spirit in my life, I become more filled with the flesh, with my soul, with my feelings, with my emotions, with my thinking. Now, I'm hoping that you're looking at me and you can relate to that because surely I'm no different from you. So, I'm asking you today, how much have you leaked the Holy Spirit? Or do you believe you can't? Once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's it. There's no leaking to be done. I know myself, when I'm a bit empty of the Holy Spirit, I become very carnal. I become very angry, agitated. You know me. Oh, there goes Debbie again. And I know that this is going to be really inviting to all of you to say, eh, Debbie, you need to spend more time with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm a mug to stand out here and say some of the things that I say. I know it's going to come back and bite me on the bum. But surely you're going to be, you're the same as me. So even when I'm Full of the Spirit, 
And I might be talking to someone else who isn't just because they're angry or whatever it is. I then get angry too and I don't just minister in this perfect love of peace and kindness. And I've got a question for you. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit is something that grows in us by the Spirit. We cannot make that happen. We can a little bit to a certain degree. We can practice being patient and we can be patient till we explode. We can practice loving till we don't want to love that person. We can practice kindness, gentleness, joy. I'm going to say some things now and I want you to just think about on a scale of a 1 to 10 where you're at. Love. How much love is in your life? Joy. You know, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I forget that sometimes when I'm just doing it really hard. I forget that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Where is your joy, Lord, in me? Peace. On that one to ten, where, how much peace do you have in, in your life? It was one of the first scriptures I learnt, these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you'll have peace. In this world you'll have tribulation. Not might. In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. What are we up to? Love, joy, peace, patience. Goodness. Kindness. And this is the one I always forget. Gentleness. And I'm of the belief, the one you usually forget when you, when you say the fruit of the Spirit is the one you're lacking most. Gentleness. I've always struggled with that, spirit, uh, that verse that says God loves a gentle and quiet spirit. I go, what? You've made me a warrior, God. How does this work? That's what it says. God loves a gentle and quiet spirit. I better move on. I think I'm still on page one. <laughs> you know, going back to being filled with the Spirit, when those penties would say to me, oh, Debbie, you know, you're not filled with the Spirit yet. You don't speak in tongues. Man, I was teaching R.I. My heart was softening and changing. I wasn't praying in tongues. I wasn't doing that. But my life had changed drastically. And here they'd tell me, oh, you don't speak in tongues, so you're not filled with the Spirit of God. That would get so up my nose. Have a look in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 10. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. It's always been a dilemma for me about putting things up on the screen. People don't even open their Bibles, not even on Sundays anymore, because it's up on the screen for them. It says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God, doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. So when, you, when Christ, when you bend your knee to Christ, his Holy Spirit comes and connects with yours, the very core of you, that very depth of you. You know where that is, the very depth God comes and connects with. You, however are controlled not by the sinful nature but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. I remember when I first came to Adelaide in my late 20s, I needed a ministry. I needed something to do so I didn't become that... that 
stagnant lagoon or billabong. And so I found a, uh, a ministry. I went to Bellevue Heights Nursing Home every Saturday morning and Rob looked after our little kids, aged five, four and two. And I went down the hall and I've, I think I've said this story, but it really changed me. I went down the corridor of this nursing home and in a room with four beds in it was one dying lady. And she was just skin and bone and I looked at her. She was all alone. It was such a sad sight. She was all alone. And I sat next to her. The other beds were empty. She was really all alone. And I thought, you're going to die today, I think. And I picked up a Bible next to her, Gideon's, good old Gideon's, open to Psalm 23. And I just said, the Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. And immediately she said, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And that was the day I really learned something about the flesh and the soul and the spirit. Her flesh was skin, her bones were dry, and her spirit was still alive. I couldn't believe it. It really rattled me to think, well, who am I? Am I still just flesh? Am I still bones? Yes, yes, yes. But how much of me is filled with the spirit? So here's another thing I'm going to ask you. One to ten. You'll know. First number. How much are you filled with the Spirit? So who's the Holy Spirit? He's the third person of the Trinity. He is intellect, emotions and will. He speaks. He speaks to our heart. He speaks to our spirit. Revelation 2.7. So listen to what he says. He intercedes for us with groaning. He groans a lot over me. Romans 8, verse 26. He groans. Have you ever groaned in prayer? You're, you're nodding, Mike. It's a travailing groaning, isn't it? And he does that for us. Because of us. He testifies. He'll bear witness of Jesus, John 15. He leads us. He gives directions to where to be, Acts 8. He commands. He orders our steps. If you're watching online, he's ordered your steps. I ask that you would be kind. He appoints. He appoints leadership, Acts 20. He can be lied to. In Acts 5, you'll read about Ananias and Sapphira. He can be blasphemed, and blaspheming the Spirit's unforgivable. Matthew 12. He can be grieved. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't know how. Maybe through our actions. Maybe through our lack of actions. Maybe through our jumping up and down to get our own way. He can be quenched. We can quench the Holy Spirit. Or we can be alive in him. I'm just going to read to you what I wrote. This was this great big Bible was one of the first Bibles I got. NIV study Bible. I've been barely saved in this get this great big thing. This is what I've written in the front of my Bible. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Ah, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. We can do that. And why? Why are we good at that? Why does that come so easily? I think one of the things is, is disappointment. I doubt that there's not a person in the room that isn't sitting there with some disappointment. Whether, I don't know what your disappointment might be. God, don't you love me? Well, I don't feel 
Bill loved you didn't give me that job I want. You didn't promote me. God, I prayed and prayed for my marriage. You know, marriage is a very tough one, really, because I understand I grew up with a lot of divorce in my household where I lived. And maybe you are praying and praying for God to change the other person in your marriage. Maybe you're not married yet. You will be one day. Maybe you're praying and praying for them to change. But can God change you? Will you only change if you will allow God to change you? Same with your partner. They'll only change if they really allow God to change them. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. A lot of people read that as poetry or something. I don't know. I don't get that. If you're watching this and you think the Bible's poetry or whatever it is, where do you stop? Where do you stop? I said to somebody once, they didn't really answer me. I said to them, so is John 3.16 poetry too? How could one man take on the sins of the whole world? Is that poetry too? Oh, no, no. Well, where do you draw the line? When we read the scriptures, we have to go, okay, <laughs> this is from beginning to end, this is God's truth. It's God's truth. We water it down. People want to take parts out of it. We've had people come to this church and I know they've wanted this church to change to fit them. And I've said to them, you are so welcome to come to this church. God loves you and will love you. But we won't skip parts of the Bible. We won't change parts of the Bible. If it's in the readings that we're currently doing, we will read them out publicly. And so anybody is welcome to come to this church. I want you to know that. Anybody is welcome. But we are not going to change the scriptures for them. And we will not delete parts of it. We will not. <laughs> Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Holy Spirit. He was right there in the creation. Colossians 1, 16, 17, Paul writes, For in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, I'm going to say this uh, man's name. I've never done French before. Pierre? That's a good start. Pierre Tilhard de Cardin <laughs> said, this is what he said, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. I think you've heard me say this before. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. I was talking to my little granddaughter the other day, one of them, we've got a few. I don't know, she might be watching today. And... I was talking to her about how wonderful it is when the glass is half full. And that's a little bit of what I've just said. When we think we're human beings, adding a teaspoon of Jesus into the glass and stirring it all up, a bit gritty, keeps stirring, that's not being in Christ. I want to ask you today, are you in Christ? Or do you just add a teaspoon of Jesus into your week, Sunday morning, and then, oh, yeah, that's right, through the week I am a Christian, mainly on Sunday morning. Or maybe I could add another teaspoon of Jesus into it. This is a very basic sermon, isn't it? I don't even know if it's a sermon. Maybe it's a talk. I don't know what it is. But I can tell you one thing. And you know this, I'm not a theologian. You can tell that. But can you tell I'm passionate for Jesus? I am passionate for Jesus. So we got saved in our back Queensland, loving Queensland. We'd bought a house on the Sunshine Coast 35 years ago. Going to move there. And our lovely pastor at the time, we'd been Christians for three years. He'd preached for three years about how good God is. So I'd concluded that 
because God is good, he definitely wants us to live on the Sunshine Coast. On the beach, it was going to be great. He came around on the Friday night and he said, Now, Rod and Debbie, you have prayed about this, haven't you? It's like, John, you know that God is good and he definitely wants us to move to the Sunshine Coast. And he said, Let's pray. God, just show Rob and Debbie if they're meant to move to the Sunshine Coast. Amen. What a great prayer. Of course he wants us to move there. This is the disaster. <laughs> we woke up in the morning and both Rob and I knew we were not to go there. We had to sell a house we'd bought. Real estate company thought we were mental. We thought we were mental. And we came to Adelaide. And here we are to this day. Here we are. So, whatever you are contemplating, anything, a job, whatever it is, moving to another church, whatever it is, just pray, Lord, is this what you want me to do? I'm coming into land. I was reading John 3 last night and... Um, it said about how... Was about, it was about Jesus being baptised. And in John 3, in the footnote of my Bible, and even in the footnotes you've got to be careful because the footnote's just an interpretation, really. It said this. It said, God gives the Spirit without limit. I thought, oh, okay. And I kept reading. And this is how things get a little bit, why we have to read and we have to learn and we have to study. Does God give the spirit to us without limit that we can heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and do all of that stuff? Yes, he does. Or is it in reference to that God gives the spirit without limit to all believers? You, 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 me. I think there is a difference. I think both are the right answer, but we need to start being very diligent in our study of God's word. We can't afford to sit here anymore and be fed like little birds with our mouths open. We go home on Sunday lunch and we either say, what what they used to call it, they used to have roast pasta Sunday lunch and they'd criticise what the pastor had said or something. I don't care, you you can roast me. Roast dinner, roast pasta. We need to be very diligent because sometimes I watch the local news and it's just local. And sometimes I watch the world news and I would suggest to you, you start watching the world news. I know lots of Christians say, I don't want to bring that stuff into my house. My house is a a house of peace. The world is groaning. The world is being rattled. The world is being reshaped. We need to get on board. And so today, look at that beautiful picture. Now, the Holy Spirit, when I read that about when Jesus was baptised in the River Jordan, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. What does that mean? I'm not a theologian. I've got to keep reading lots to find out stuff. Does it mean that the Holy Spirit was gentle? Like a dove? Or, I don't know, was it just the way the Holy Spirit came? Or is he like a dove? Now, I just, did you hear what I just said? Or is he the Holy Spirit, is he like a dove? Is he, we have to stop saying it. The Holy Spirit is not it. I like it when Rob refers me to her or she, not an it. Rob and I were married a long time ago now. If we had just got married, like when we get saved, that's it, I'm saved, I'm filled with the Spirit, that's good. We have to maintain our marriages, all our relationships. 
We have to maintain our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We have to. This is not a choice. And I want you to really think about this. We're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to come and fill us. Because I want him to come and touch you. I want your lives full of him. I want to be full of him. Where you've had disappointment in your life, you've got to let it go. I know it's confusing with disappointment. Do we fight to get what is right? Or is God saying, it's not what I want for you? We could have, Rob and I, we could have moved to the Sunshine Coast. We could have been living in paradise and it would have ended up probably being like hell. I don't know. We didn't come here to plant a church. We came here because we felt that families needed to be saved. Look what God did. And I still get confused why there's so many empty seats. Obviously, I'm doing something not right, I guess. But look what he did. What's he want to do with your life? But you've got to be filled with him, listening to him. You don't have to get up in the middle of the night like I do. But you've got to be very proactive in Jesus. Now, I know some of you are going to walk out the door and think, oh, goodness me, what a sensational nitwit or whatever. I don't know what you're going to think. I don't care. I care for you. But we need to be ready for what's ahead. That's all I can say. You young people over there, man, you've got many years ahead of you. God wants you to be leaders. God wants you to be full of his spirit and lead. God doesn't have grandkids. You're not his grandkid. You're his adult, actually. You're his adult and he wants to use you abundantly. Every person in here, he wants to use you. We have to be filled with him. Okay, we're going to be we're going to come to Christ now. We can come to Christ. You know, when we come to him, some of us think we come to Christ to be fixed. No, there's a, an exchange. We come to Christ with our messed up broken life. And there's an exchange. We take on his life. We take on his victories. I get very distressed when I hear about cheap grace. I'm not a legalist. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not any of those things. I just, I'm, I'm someone who loves Jesus. I come into his house because I want to be in his house. I love him. 